Jay moved to Cornell for her PhD, uh, and uh, I think her thesis was on viral movement, basically how viruses move around in plant, um, basically um, molecular plant physiology. And then after graduation, uh, she moved to University of Tor Toronto to do a postdoc uh, working on effector-triggered uh, immunity. And uh, in 2011, 2012, she moved here to PGC and then appointed as agent system professor here in our department. So today, uh, she's going to tell us her progress in the past few years about her research, by the way, continuing on molecular mechanisms of the UTI plant pathogen. With that, let's give her a big hug. <laughs> associated with pathogens like bacterial flagellin and induce uh, immune responses that help to protect them against infection. So, uh, of course, pathogens can't benefit in that case, and so they've evolved mechanisms to deliver proteins to plant cells that allow them to suppress immune responses in the plant, and that uh, causes disease in those plants. Uh, and in turn, plants over evolutionary time can evolve immune receptors that specifically recognize different bacterial or other pathogenic proteins in the plant, and that leads to strong defenses that are considered as effector-triggered immunity. So I, I just want to briefly introduce you to the different people in the lab and um, how they fit into this. So uh, Dr. Yuan Chen, who's a postdoc in the lab, uh, is primarily interested in citrus screening. Uh, this is a really devastating path, uh, disease in Florida that's caused by a bacteria, and she's interested in using these conserved structures associated with bacteria to induce immunity in the plant. And so hopefully you had a chance to hear her talk at the retreat in the fall. And Carl Schreiber, who's another postdoc, is interested in these targets of uh, bacterial pathogens and how the bacteria manipulate those targets in order to promote disease. And then the rest of the lab focuses more on the resistance side, and this part will be mainly my focus today. So Ilea and Yana are both working on a tomato-infecting strain of our pathogen of interest, and Mayel is interested in the molecular mechanisms of uh, recognition of these effectors in Arabidopsis and Benthamiana. Okay, so the pathogen that we mainly work with is called Pseudomonas stringae. So this is a gram-negative bacterial pathogen. And this has the ability to infect over 150 different plant species. So it has very broad array of different hosts that it can infect. But each individual strain is adapted to only cause disease on a few hosts. So for instance, this strain, Pseudomonas ringue capybar tomato, it was isolated on tomato and it can cause disease on Arabidopsis, but it can't cause disease on these other uh, plants shown here. Uh, and so uh, these strains, because they're highly adapted, to different hosts, it means there's a lot of coalition between the, the pathogenic strain and the host that they can infect. Uh, and strains on tomato have also emerged in agricultural settings to overcome natural resistance that has been bred in. And so I'll talk about that in the second part of today's talk. And so importantly for today, pseudomonas can also infect the pumpkins. So be glad <laughs> <laughs> you have pumpkins. <laughs> Okay, so Pseudomonas is an extracellular pathogen, so here you can see an electron micrograph of plant cells, and the bacteria are in apoplast, so that's the space in between these plant cells. And the plant cell wall is a really formidable obstacle for a lot of uh, plant pathogens. So um, in our case, the bacteria use a structure called the type 3 secretion system, and this is basically like a molecular syringe that allows the bacteria to inject proteins into the plant cell. So we have uh, Pseudomonas ringae, our pathogen, 
in the apoplast of the plant and it's injecting effectors into the host. And in a susceptible background, these effectors can promote virulence of the pathogen leading to the disease symptoms shown here. However, in a resistant host, um, so one that contains the appropriate resistance protein or nod-like receptor, which is also called an NLR, you get recognition of these effectors leading to a form of programmed cell death called the hypersensitive response. And so this um, programmed cell death allows the, the plant to kill off the infected part of itself so that the rest of the plant can survive and be resistant to infection. Um, and effectors can also evolve to, uh, to suppress this recognition and that would make the plant diseased again. So you, sh you should be able to tell from this that effectors actually have dual roles depending on the genetics of the host. So in a susceptible host, they're actually promoting virulence of the bacteria, whereas in a resistance host, they're actually eliciting that, that recognition of themselves. Okay, so the, I have to give you a little bit more background on this recognition. So you could imagine that there would be direct recognition between an effector and the resistance protein. Um, and that would be analogous to a receptor ligand type of model. Um, but that's not very commonly observed uh, for pseudomonas DNA. And what's more commonly observed is what we call indirect recognition. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on that first. So this is um, called the guard model. And I'm going to start with what happens in the susceptible background first. So you have your effector injected into the plant. Most of these proteins appear to have some sort of enzymatic activity. And so they modify their host target, uh, and that will um, promote virulence uh, of the bacteria and um, susceptibility in, in, the, in the plant. If, however, this host protein is associated with a resistance protein, one of these immune receptors, then that modification <coughs> by the protein actually triggers a, an immune response. And again, you can see the hypersensitive response here. So what's important here is that this is indirect recognition through uh, modification of this, uh, this target. And this could either be the real target of the effector or it could be a mimic of the, the, uh, of the effector. Okay, so the system that we're particularly interested in is an effector called hopc one a So again, this is a, a type three secreted effector and it's part of the YOPJ super family of effectors. Um, this family is also found in animal infecting pathogenic bacteria, which is quite unusual um, for a lot of uh, these types of pathogens. And we've shown that this is an acetyl transferase. So HOPC1A is recognized by ZAR1, which is a canonical immune receptor. And it has the typical domains, a coil-coil domain, a nucleotide binding site domain, and a leucine rich repeat domain that are often seen in these proteins. And this immune receptor is required for the recognition of hopc one And we've also identified Z1, which is a pseudokinase that, again, is required for the recognition of hopc one a And uh, Z1 is acetylated by hopc one a So this illustrates that guard model where recognition happens indirectly through um, this intermediate protein. So you can kind of think of Z1 as being a mousetrap for the pathogen. So Z1 here would be the cheese, and um, hopsy one a would be the mouse. And so the mouse, as it starts to eat the cheese, that would be like acetylation of Z1, and that would trigger the mouse trap to uh, release, and then you'd have recognition by ZAR1. And we were particularly interested in trying to understand the system in more detail, because Z1 uh, is a pseudokinase. So it doesn't have uh, kinase activity, and it appears to only have a function in immunity. So we thought that this might be a really good target for potentially engineering broader spectrum resistance against other effectors or other pathogens. And so to do that, we wanted to really probe what are the molecular determinants of recognition in this system. So Mayel Bowden, who's a postdoc in the lab, uh, set up a, a transient assay in Nicotiana benthamiana using agrobacterium. And we thought that this would be a really nice way to use all the tools that we've developed in Arabidopsis and take advantage of mutants and truncations. And then we could use the system to look at protein-protein interactions, do transient expression to look at the phenotypes that were induced, and then, um, uh, and then also look at potentially a co of proteins. 
And so very simply, our genes of interest would be combed into binary vectors expressed in agrobacterium. And then the bacteria are infiltrated into different parts of the Nicotiana benthamiana or Nicotiana tobacco leaves. And then most of these are inducible, so we would um, spray them to induce the expression. And then we could use um, the system for all of our phenotypes and interactions of interest. And so one of the first things that Mayel noticed uh, is that co-expression of HOPC1A and Z1 was sufficient to, um, oh, it's still too bright. Um, okay, so it was sufficient to cause the, the immune response. So you can sort of barely see here, there might be a crinkling of a leaf. And when you have um, that macroscopic immune response, it's associated with ion leakage. So that's what's shown in the bar graph over here. So as the cell is dying, it's releasing ions into the surrounding media, and you can measure that by increases in conductivity. So here you can see we get uh, the immune response, high levels of ion leakage, and this is dependent on the catalytic residue in, for uh, acetyltransferase activity. So when we delete that, we lose the hypersensitive response, and we have low levels of ion leakage. And co-expression of ZAR1 was not required um, for this phenotype. So the um, catalytic activity of hops una being necessary for recognition, this is consistent with what we'd see in Arabidopsis, so that was uh, very reassuring to us. But it also suggested that Benthi carried a ZAR1 homolog. And so Maya looked at the Benthi genome to try to identify ZAR1 homologs and identify two potential homologs, which he silenced using viral-induced gene silencing. And so now you can see when you co-express hops una and Z1, you don't have the hypersensitive response and you lose ion leakage. And you can restore this um, by co-expressing the Arabidopsis homologue of ZAR1, which partially complements um, that phenotype um, almost to uh, the level that we would normally see. And so this was really interesting for us because it's one of the few examples where you have recognition of an effector being conserved across plant families. So in this case, from the Brassicaceae to the Solanaceae. And so we wanted to then use this system in order to really understand the, um, the other requirements. And so one of the first thing we did uh, is to test whether the Arabidopsis homolog of Z1, so this is again the pseudokinase, was able to interact with ZAR1 from Arabidopsis and Benthi. So this is a co precipitation experiment and we have ZAR1 tagged with the MYC uh, tag and you can detect that. And then we have a Z1 tag with a flag tag, and we can detect that. And then when we uh, uh, IP immunoprecipitate with the MYC antibody and detect with the MYC antibody, we can detect all the ZAR proteins. And then the last panel shows you the interaction. So we immunoprecipitate with the MYC antibody against ZAR1, which is the immune receptor, and then detect with the flag antibody against Z1. And you can see that Z1 from Arabidopsis can interact with both Benthi and ZAR uh, from Arabidopsis. And I told you before that it looked like there were two homologs of ZAR in the Benthi genome. <coughs> and we, we were not able to amplify that second homolog, uh, but it was very similar to ZAR1. And so Mayel created a construct that just expressed the corresponding version in ZAR1, so it basically lacked that last uh, domain. And you can see that that um, truncated ZAR1 is no longer able to interact um, with uh, with Z1. So that suggests that the LLR region of ZAR1 is necessary for this interaction. Okay, so we really wanted to be able to show what part of ZAR1 is actually important. So I told you already it has these three different domains. And so we individually um, tested the different domains of ZAR1 for their ability to interact with Z1. And you can see that the LLR region is sufficient for the interaction with Z1 but the interaction is weaker than when you have the full length ZAR. So that suggests that it's able to interact with more than just that domain. And that would be consistent with our yeast data, where we had previously shown that, uh, that the coil-coil region of ZAR1 interacts with Z1. And so to, um, to actually test this in planta, we carried out bimolecular fluorescence complementation so these are um, also called split YFP experiments. You have one protein of interest fused to half of YFP and the other protein of interest fused to the other half of YFP. And if your two proteins of interest interact, then you see fluorescence. 
So you can see here that if we co-express Z1 and the coil-coil region of ZAR1 in either direction, we, we have that interaction. So that means that Z1 is able to interact with two different parts of ZAR1. Okay, so we next wanted to take advantage of a large collection of mutants that we had identified <coughs> in um, our genetic screens to see what the effect of these mutations were on the interactions I just showed you. And so we have um, mutations in the NVARC domain as well as the loosening rich repeat domain. And in Arabidopsis, all of these mutants do not have that macroscopic, macroscopic defense response that I told you about, and they um, support higher levels of bacterial growth. So that would be consistent with no recognition. So again, we carried out communal precipitation experiments, and here we tested for the ZAR1 mutants, or wild type ZAR, for their ability to interact with Arabidopsis Z1. And you can see that um, two mutants in the LLR region, so 645 and 816, were no longer able to interact with Z1. So at least for these mutants, they seem to be impaired in the interaction with Z1, and that would be why we don't see recognition uh, of the effector protein. We then turned to mutants in Z1 that we had similarly identified in genetic screens. And the ones in black are from genetic screens, and the ones in, in the orangey color are the sites that are acetylated by the effector protein. So here, if we co-expressed HOPC1A and Z1, for most of these, we saw the hypersensitive response and high levels of iron <laughs> leakage. However, for this D231N mutant, we lost the hypersensitive response and we saw no ion leakage, which suggested that it was no longer able to mediate the recognition. So again, we tested this in the communoprecipitation assay, uh, so the different uh, Z1 mutants against the leucine rich repeat region of ZAR1. And you can see that the D231N mutant in this lane is the only one that has completely lost the interaction uh, with Z1, uh, with uh, the LLR region. And the, the 128 seems to have a weaker interaction, but apparently this is still sufficient um, to mediate the, the um, response. Um, okay, so, so far I told you about the interactions between the immune receptor and the pseudokinase and how those are important for mediating recognition. So that, and I want to turn now to the immune receptor ZAR1. So this, uh, these receptors, you can imagine, it's very important to actually regulate uh, when they turn on immunity. Because if they turn on immunity in a non-controlled manner, the entire plant's going to die. And so you can see that a little bit here um, on the, the left side of the leaf of the asterisk. And so to try to get to those types of functions, um, we decided to use domain truncations and express those proteins to see if we could um, see some of those autoactivation phenotypes. So here we took uh, different parts of ZAR1, different domains, and fused them to uh, YFP. And you can see that the coil-coil region uh, was able to induce higher levels of ion leakage compared to full-length ZAR or different domains um, or this slightly longer fusion. So the YFP uh, part of the protein is known to have weak dimerization activity. And so we thought it was possible that the coil-coil domain might itself be dimerizing. And so to test this, Mayel again carried out uh, bimolecular fluorescent complementation assays and looked to see whether the coil-coil region could interact with itself. And indeed, we saw um, that signal. And we were also able to show that the coil-coil region could dimerize in yeast. So if we come back um, to this part, you'll notice that if we added just a little bit of the nucleotide binding region, that was sufficient to suppress this autoactivity. And we thought that this might be due to an interaction between the um, and the arc domain and the coil-coil domain. And so to test this, uh, Mael uh, again uh, carried out split YFP experiments. So we have the coil-coil region of ZAR1 with uh, different parts of the NB arc. So this would be the full NB arc. This one is missing the R2 subdomain, and this one just has the, the nucleotide binding domain. And the nucleotide binding domain was sufficient for this interaction, but we saw a much stronger interaction when we also included the R1 uh, subdomain. So we then um, tested whether um, 
of what was the minimal part of the NV arc region that was necessary to suppress that autoactivity. So the first panel, this is just the control, so the coil-coil region fused to YP, we get uh, medium to strong hypersensitive response, that macroscopic uh, immune response in all of the leaves. And as we added on um, increasing parts of the, the NVR domain or the entire protein, you can see that we lost uh, that autoactivity. So the nucleotide binding domain was sufficient <coughs> to suppress uh, the autoactivity. And I'm not showing you the data here, but we also took advantage of uh, the mutants in um, the NVR region that we had already identified. And we showed that um, the mutations in this region impair the interaction, but we don't restore the autoactivity. So it seems that the, the mutations we've identified are more involved in activation of the, um, the immune receptor as opposed to the interaction. So we then turn to potential interactions between the NVARC uh, domain and the leucine rich repeat domain. So here we have the full leucine rich repeat domain or a truncated version tested again against the three different versions of the NV arc. And again, you can see that the NV domain is sufficient for the interaction, but we get a much stronger interaction if we have uh, the NV arc one uh, with that arc one domain. And again, mutations in the NV arc one uh, domain impair the interaction with the leucine rich repeat region, but the mutations in the LLR do not generally affect the interaction with the NV arc. And that would be consistent with what I showed you earlier, that um, two of those three mutations in the LLR region are more responsible for the interaction with Z1, as opposed to the interactions within the immune receptor. Okay, so the, um, the data I've just showed you about the, the similar interactions between the CC and the leucine rich repeat uh, region with the NVR suggested that we might have uh, the same interface interacting with both domains. And so we, we've, again, carried out those interaction assays between the coil-coil and the NVR1, and you can see that interaction. And then we co-expressed the third domain to see if we could interfere with that interaction. So here, when we added in the leucine rich repeat region, we saw a decrease in fluorescence, suggesting that it was interfering with the ability of these two domains to interact with each other. Similarly, we, um, tested uh, the interaction of the LLR with the NVR1. You can see that those interact. When we added in the coil-coil region, again, we saw a decrease in fluorescence, suggesting that the coil-coil region was interfering with the interaction between those two domains. Uh, so then we tested for the effect of Z1 on, on these interactions. Uh, so when we co-expressed the coil-coil region and NVR1, uh, those interact. If we add in Z1, we didn't see any effect on the fluorescence. Um, however, when we co-expressed the uh, LLR region with the NV arc, either the, the full NV arc or just the, the one with the arc one domain, you can see that we have greater fluorescence when we add in uh, Z1, suggesting that Z1 was able to stabilize the interaction between these two proteins. Um, so to further validate that, if you remember back to the beginning part, I talked to you about this B231N mutant that can't interact with the LLR region. And so we tested that to see whether it would have the same phenotype. And so this one doesn't interact with the LLR, and we don't see the stabilization that we see with the, the functional Z1. Okay, so I know I told you a lot of things already, so I'm going to um, give you a model to try to help bring all of that together. So in the inactive state, we think that there are two pools, at least two pools of, of ZAR1. So one pool of ZAR1, the immune receptor, is not complex with uh, Z1 uh, or any other related kinase. And then there's another pool of, of ZAR1 that's complex with Z1 as, or potentially other um, kinases that are uh, present in the same genomic cluster as Z1. And I'll come back to those in a minute. And so this could explain how the coil-coil uh, domain interacts with the same part of the NV domain as the leucine rich repeat um, and the NV domain. And this would also um, explain why we'd have to have interactions between these domains to suppress autoactivity uh, of the immune receptor. So then when the effector is introduced into the plant, it acetylates Z1. And this, we think, causes conformational rearrangements in 
which is our one, that open up the protein and allow the exchange of ADP for ATP. And in the active complex then, we would have dimerization of the coil-coil region, which could then act as a signal to induce immunity. And Z1 here would then uh, stabilize the interaction between uh, the NBR region and the leucine rich P region. Okay, so we've you set up a lot of assays and a lot of systems now to really probe these interactions. And so to make use of all of those, we've also carried out a natural diversity screen uh, in Rhabdopsis for hops one a recognition. And so I'm just gonna give you a little taste of what we're doing with this. Initially, we used Magnus Nordberg's collection of 96 ecotypes to look for uh, their ability to recognize hops one a And uh, ecotypes, if you're, if you're not familiar with them, they are naturally diverse, and so we can take advantage of that natural genetic diversity to try to understand um, other uh, residues that could be important. And so we identified 12 uh, ecotypes that appear to not have recognition of hops one a And then in collaboration with Chelsea and her, and her postdoc showed on SAS, uh, we developed a consensus sequence uh, for ecotypes um, uh, either able or not able to recognize uh, the effector, and then use that to screen the, the, the 1001 genome project developed by the Ecker Lab. And so again, you know, these are just some of the phenotypes of, of different ecotypes that are very broadly diverse. Um, and so this identified another 205 ecotypes that we tested for their ability to uh, recognize hops one a You can see that we managed to really dramatically increase the number of ecotypes that lack recognition. And so we've identified uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in nine ecotypes uh, that are in either ZAR1 or Z1. And now we're using all of those assays I told you about to look at the effect of diversity on all these different phenotypes. So protein-protein interactions, their ability to complement the silence benthy line, and also uh, whether they cause autoactivity. Okay, so in this first part of the talk, I told you that the ZAR1 recognition pathway is conserved from the Brassicaceae to the Solanaceae for hop one a recognition. Um, Z1 is able to interact with multiple domains of ZAR1, and the interaction between the leucine rich repeat uh, region of ZAR1 and Z1 is particularly important for that immune response. The coil coil region is important for triggering the, the hypersensitive response, which again is that macroscopic immune response we see, as well as dimerization. And then um, within the immune receptor itself, there are multiple interactions that regulate activity, and Z1 is able to stabilize some of those. And we're now using natural diversity and an error-prone screen to identify additional determinants in these proteins that are important uh, for recognition. And the overarching goal here is to try to use the system to see if we could engineer a decoy that would be important for recognition. So since uh, we identified um, this decoy system, there have been, there's been a lot of work from other people showing that ZAR1 is a really important hub for the recognition of other effectors. So for instance, ABREC is from Xanthomonas, HOPF2 is from Pseudomonas, and both of these um, uh, work through ZAR1 with um, different kinases that are present in the same genomic cluster as Z1 for the recognition uh, of these effectors. And then most recently, in Brian's lab, uh, ZOP J4, which is a homologue of, of ZAR1, or, or uh, hopsi one a um, also uses ZAR1 from Nicotiana benthamiana for recognition. And so uh, here we have three different unrelated effectors, um, four with the, the two that are related, um, being uh, recognized all through ZAR1 through different enzymatic activities. So they're not all acetyltransferases. And they're um, working with these different atypical kinases <coughs> genomically and clustered um, for recognition. So we think that this is a really powerful system to try to uh, potentially engineer, again, for uh, broader spectrum resistance. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears now and tell you about <coughs> our tomato work. So I told you at the beginning that pseudomonas strains can cause substantial disease in agricultural contexts. And so uh, in uh, California, there was uh, an environmental situation with a lot of rain, which I know hasn't happened in a long time. 
but, um, but they had uh, very bad losses from Pseudomonas stringae strains. Um, and so historically, uh, the strain that was present in those, um, in those environments was called BC3000. And the, the, in the 1930s, plant breeders identified a gene cluster, which was later identified to encode PTO, PRF, and a few other genes. And um, they intergressed this from a wild species called Solanum pimpinellifolium. And this was really effective in controlling bacterial spec for a long time. And so this works because genes in this cluster are able to identify and recognize two effectors that are found uh, in the strain that was commonly in those um, situations, in those agricultural.